Hi, thanks for joining us for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Today's message is about dangerous faith. We will be looking at Luke 22, verses 47 through 65. If you'd like to follow along with the Life Notes, go ahead and download those now from calvaryaz.com forward slash Life Notes. Now, here's Pastor Robert Smith. You can go ahead and have a seat. It's good to be with you today. I invite you to take your Bible or Bible app and open to the book of Luke, chapter 22. It's where we're going to be at today. And if you don't have a Bible or a Bible app on your device, feel free to use one of the Bibles and seats in front of you. It'll be on page 1044. 49. If you're in Parker, you can go ahead and make your way to the table in the back of the room at this time. There's some Bibles back there. Uh, Same page number for you guys, and uh, you can make use of those during your time. And uh, for all of us, as always, if you don't have a Bible, we'd love to gift you one so you can use that Bible during service today and go ahead and just take it home with you because we want you to know the truth of God's words. And uh, speaking of knowing the truth, Easter is coming up, and uh, you heard that as an announcement earlier in our service but we want you to be inviting your friends, your family, your neighbors. This is a great opportunity for you to say, hey, would you go to church with me? Uh, We know statistically there's a higher probability that they'll say yes uh, on this time more than any other time during the year. So use that to your benefit, but because we want them to understand the truth of who Jesus is and what he did for us. Because we know that if they know the truth and walk in that, then God's going to change their life. Because in so many areas, uh, we know that truth is important and a misunderstanding of the facts can lead us to a dangerous place. Uh, And uh, we know that in nature, you know, if you're traveling and in a new place and you don't understand all the dangers uh, that are inherent to that place, then you can get in trouble. And sadly, we see this here locally when people come and travel and they get themselves in trouble on the lake or the river and, uh, or they go hiking in the desert in the summertime. And those of us who are locals go, why would you do that? But they don't understand the dangers that are before them. You know, you, you see this in certain trades. Uh, those of us who think that we can uh, be experts because we know how to navigate YouTube get ourselves in trouble because we're like, oh, we're just gonna do this job. We're gonna do this home improvement task and we end up making things worse. Uh, You even see this with exotic pets. Uh, We went to uh, the Keepers of the Wild uh, recently and they're sharing these stories about these people who got these exotic pets, not knowing some of the traits and tendencies of these animals until someone got hurt. And then they're like, oh, this is apparently how they behave. This not understanding the dangers in front of us can be a significant thing. And theologically, we know this is true as well. There are certain things that we have to understand about who God is and the truth about what he has given us in his word or we're gonna find ourselves in a difficult spot. And as we continue on this journey to Easter, our next stop here, we're gonna see that there's some people who found themselves as the bad guys in the story because they didn't understand truth. They didn't understand the truth of who Jesus was and what his plan was and how he operated. And so they fell into some dangerous traps and became the enemy when really, I think at the the core, they were desiring to be the good guys in this story. So let's take a look, Luke chapter 22. We're gonna take a look at this and see how we can avoid doing the same thing um, in our life. So Luke 22, we're gonna pick up in verse 47 as we continue on this journey to Easter, and it says this. It says, now when he, that is Jesus, was still speaking, there came a crowd and the man called Judas, one of the 12, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those who were around him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, should we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched the ear and healed him. And Jesus said to the chief priests and the officers of the temple and the elders who had come out against him, have you come out as against a robber with swords and with clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. It says, then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house, and Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, this man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, woman, I do not know him. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, certainly, this man is also with him, for he too is a Galilean. 
But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Now the men who were holding Jesus in custody, mocking him as they beat him, and they also blindfolded him and kept asking him, prophesy, who is it that struck you? And they said many other things against him, blaspheming him. So we're gonna kind of work our way through this passage and look at some of the different characters that are represented here. But before we do that, I want us to kind of acknowledge the big picture scheme here that this is the beginning of the fulfillment of God's upside down plan. See, Jesus is arrested. He's starting his, his very intentional journey to the cross here. And this is at the core of what his plan and purpose was. He knew this. He had been telling the disciples this. He had been preparing for this. All the other things that he did were leading to this point of him being arrested and giving himself over to be killed on our behalf. And so this is the fulfillment of this plan, but if we look at it, we can acknowledge it by our standards, this plan is a little backwards from what we would do. This is a little upside down than what we would construct if we were making the plan ourselves. Because you have this king from the beginning who is sent to earth as a baby to a really insignificant family in an obscure place. Out of the 33 years that he lives, he spends 30 of those years in relative obscurity and we don't even have record of most of it. He, he got to the point of starting this goal and this ministry that was set out to change the world and yet he denies all political and military influence and power and leadership. He starts a pattern of, of inviting followers and he does this by gathering unloyal disciples who will betray him in the most significant moments. He sets out to achieve victory and he does it through legal defeat. He sets out to create a pattern for us to be forgiven for our sins by doing basically nothing ourselves. Everything about this plan seems backwards from what we would construct. And we could look at this and chuckle and say, why would he do it that way? But really we should look at it and rejoice knowing that his plan is so much better than what we would do. Because our plan as humanity is so much reflected in what he's battling against here. Because humanity created what is seen in the, the leadership of religion at that time, these chief priests and elders and scribes and Pharisees. They were the ones who were saying, hey, we're going to set the tone for what it means to follow God. They were creating the man-made application of this and they were so frequently getting it wrong. See, their plan was one that took God's word and often distorted the application of it. Their plan was one that often emphasized uh, rules over religion and often emphasized appearance over obedience and created hypocrisy. Their plan was the one that even at times seemed to emphasize works over simply having faith and trusting Jesus. And see, their plan not only got the application and what was supposed to happen wrong, their, their plan was also the system that denied Jesus as the Messiah. And their plan was the, the one that came to say, hey, we're going to crucify the one who has come to save us. See, they were supposed to be the good guys. They were supposed to be the ones of the story that were the hero, that were reinforcing the mission of God, and yet they were the ones opposing it. And similarly, even the disciples, the one closest to Jesus, the one that Jesus had trained intently for three years, when things got real, started to push against him, even denying him and working directly against him. So how do we avoid doing that? How do we avoid going from the people who desire to be the good guys, to be on the winning team, and not end up like the Pharisees, the religious people, or even the disciples in these significant moments in opposing Jesus. Well, I think there's three dangers that, that we see as we walk through this portion of Jesus' life and ministry that if we're aware of these, we can hopefully avoid that same trap. And the first danger is the danger of believing that proximity is enough. So when we look at Judas' life specifically, he is the, the inside man. He's the one who is bribed to betray Jesus. He's the one that the Pharisees use to get intel on where he's going to be and when so that they can arrest him. He is the one who brings this plan to fruition, essentially. And it's interesting because we look at this and we go, why would he do that? 
After all, he spent three years with Jesus. He saw it all. He saw the Sermon on the Mount, this greatest message ever told. He heard all of the other teachings. He was there when Jesus walked on water and calmed the storms and the seas with just his words. He watched Jesus heal the lame and bring sight to the blind. He watched Jesus raise Lazarus and Jairus' daughter and the widow's son from the dead with just his words. He saw all of this and more. In fact, we know there's more because the, the Bible says that not everything Jesus did is described here and there's so much more that could be described of his teaching and his healing and his power and majesty here on earth. He had incredible proximity to Jesus and his ministry and yet seemingly that wasn't enough to result in true faith and life change for Judas because it doesn't appear that he was deeply devoted to Jesus as his savior. After all, when given an opportunity to profit off of his betrayal, full well knowing what the Pharisees were wanting to do, he took it in an instant. For 30 silver coins that scholars say is somewhere between three and $500 of value by, by today's standards, he betrayed Jesus, showing how little it actually took for him to turn on his savior. And that should cause us to question, why is that? How could he get to that point? What caused him to so easily turn over? And I think if we back up a little bit, we can learn a little bit. Because see, before he's arrested in the garden, Jesus is, is praying and petitioning God to, to provide another way. Before that, we see that he's in the upper room with the disciples. A couple weeks ago, we saw Pastor Pete walk through Jesus instituting communion and that, that tradition that we still carry on today. But there's some other events that happen at that dinner table that night. That when we look at Matthew chapter 26, we get some other details that Luke doesn't give us. And that is, as Jesus is around the table, he says, hey, one of you will betray me tonight. He also tells Peter that he's gonna deny him three times before the rooster crows. We saw that fulfilled here also. But he says, hey, one of you is going to betray me. And all the disciples, it says, are shocked. They're like, how could this be? And Matthew says they take turns going around the table saying, is it I, Lord? Like, surely it's not me, Lord. Who, who is it? Is it I, Lord, they ask. And they get to Judas, and Judas continues the question, which is a bit ironic since he knows the answer. But it comes to Judas, and he says, is it I, Rabbi? And Matthew makes a point to show us this, that Judas asks the question very differently. All the other disciples say, is it I, Lord? And Judas addresses him as rabbi or teacher. Now, this can seem a little trivial, but it's actually much bigger than just the, the semantics of what's said around a dinner table that night because in all of the Gospels, there's no account of Judas ever addressing Jesus as Lord. He only ever addresses Jesus as rabbi or teacher. And so we don't know or have the ability to completely understand where he was at in his heart and his belief, but it would seem from these outward appearances that he never got to the place of professing Jesus as the Lord of his life. He simply saw him as a good teacher, a good role model, a good example for his life, which helps explain how he could so easily betray him and turn it over. Because the proximity of being near Jesus didn't result in life change. And the truth is that this danger of proximity thinking is the same for us. Because it's easy to think that just being in this place and just showing up and having some God stuff in our life will fix things. And the truth is that it will improve some things. You'll get some benefit and blessing to just being near it even if you don't believe it. But that's just some spillover blessing. That's not the true blessing that God wants to bring into your life. But if you want to see God work with power, with change and transformation, with hope and healing and salvation in your life, proximity isn't what brings that about. It's only choosing to surrender your life to him that will bring that into your life. It takes understanding that you're a sinner and there's nothing you can do to fix the fact that you have spent your life and are spending your life sinning and rebelling against God's plan. It takes believing that Jesus is more than just a good teacher, a good leader, a role model, but that he's the son of God and savior of the world. That he came to die on a cross for your sins and raise from the grave three days later. 
And then it takes you choosing to surrender everything in your life down to him and say, Jesus, you are the Lord, you are the boss, you are the master, the director, the captain, whatever verb you wanna use, you are that in my life. And choosing every day to say, I'm going to bow down and worship and follow you with everything you have. And when you come to that point, then you see God show up in power, not just in some little sprinkle blessings, but in transformation, in hope, in healing, in incredible life change because that's what he promises when we truly surrender our life to him. And so the question is, are you going to do that? Are you going to surrender your life to him or are you going to be like Judas and continue in this pattern of faking it? Because being near it, showing up to church doesn't change your life. Adding some Jesus teaching on top of some other self-help ideas doesn't change your life. Having a spouse who believes in Jesus doesn't change you. Only surrendering your life to Jesus will change it. And if you're faking it, eventually that will be found out. It was true for Judas, and unfortunately, it's true for us as well. So it's the first danger we see in this story. And the second danger is for those of us who have gotten to that point of believing in Jesus and saying, yes, I do believe. And that is the danger of fair weather faith. The danger of fair weather faith. See, it's easy to, to spend our time beating up on Judas he was the one obviously most opposed to Jesus. He is betraying him in the most bold way. But his companion, Peter, has a pretty significant problem here as well. He goes from uh, being someone who is adamantly uh, pledging his allegiance to Jesus around the table that night, saying, Lord, I would die before I denied you. So he was the one, we, he, we aren't told his name here in Luke, but the other gospels tell us he was the one who cut off the high priest's servant's ear in the, the, the courtyard. He was the one who took out the sword and sliced an ear off. He was willing to, to go to battle for Jesus to just a few short moments later completely denying three times that he even knew who Jesus was. I think that at the core of that, there's something about Peter's faith in this moment that when things got difficult, it wavered. When things were easy and good, he was rock solid. And we could spend several sermons diving into the life of Peter and, and what got him to this place. We could see that there's some, some aspects of impulsiveness in his life, like deciding in the moment to cut off someone's ear. There's some, there's some moments where he would speak without thinking but not three times in a row. No, that was an intentional, deliberate choice. And there's some, some good benefits of Peter. We see that he was willing to, to risk and be brave, and you see that this night. Because again, he was willing, he was willing to take a risk and be brave and defend Jesus even violently until Jesus called him down and said no. He was willing to take a risk and follow with the crowds and follow the movement of Jesus' arrest in this fake trial that gets to the high priest's house. He's willing to take a risk and kind of be in that environment to watch and see what's happening. But as soon as the risk turns to him directly and he's confronted and asks, hey, aren't you with this Jesus guy? He turns real quickly and denies it. And it's not that this is a soldier with a sword drawn and pointed at Peter's face of, hey, do you believe in this Jesus? Are you one of his followers? No, it says, that around a campfire, a servant girl, likely a teenager, is like, hey, don't you know him? Aren't you with him? Not exactly a high-risk situation for Peter, but he folded. There's another story that we see a similar situation for Peter. I mentioned it earlier as one of the things that John had seen, but you see uh, earlier on in the life and ministry of Jesus this moment that he walks on water. One of the kind of the better known portions of Jesus' life and ministry. And you can read about it in, in Matthew 14, but the, the disciples go out on a boat and they're all there. Jesus stays behind on the shore to spend some time praying and, and by himself. And the disciples find themselves in a storm and Jesus walks on water to catch up with them. And so they see this figure walking on water and they're afraid because all of us would be afraid if we saw someone walking on water in the midst of a storm. And Peter, again, being that impulsive risk taker, goes, Jesus, if it's you, call me out on the water with you. So Jesus calls his bluff, and he goes, okay, come on out. 
And in Matthew, we see that, that Peter does this and he's out walking on the waters in the midst of the storm and it's incredible, but Matthew says it's great until he looks around and sees the danger he's in and sees the storms and the waves and he begins to live in fear and he begins to sink because he doubts Jesus. See, we see a pattern in Peter's life up to this point that he was willing to trust and follow Jesus until it got risky for him personally. Now, thankfully, this pattern seems to end here for Peter. If you were to continue reading on in the Gospels, you see that after Jesus went to the cross and was crucified and resurrected, he meets up with the disciples again. And, and Peter and Jesus have a, a conversation about this denial, and, and Peter is repentant and remorseful, and Jesus is full of grace and forgiveness. And Jesus calls and challenges him to go lead his people and lead the church, and Peter does that wonderfully. He becomes the, the chief leader of the, the church in Jerusalem, and, and he leads so well, in fact, that he gets on the radar of the Roman emperor Nero, who hated Christians. And he calls for Peter's crucifixion if he doesn't deny Jesus, and Peter passed this test. And so Peter is crucified, and in fact, he requests to be crucified upside down because he didn't deem himself worthy to be crucified the same way Jesus was. He went from cowardice to boldness in his faith because of Jesus' grace in his life. But see, for us, that, that danger of his early fair-weather faith is a risk for us as well. That's a danger we have to confront because it's so easy to trust and believe in Jesus when things are going great, when we see prayers being answered, when blessings are flowing into our life, when everything is great and we couldn't ask for anything better. But when life gets difficult, when life is tragic and hard, when we seem stuck in the muck and the mire and we can't seem to, to move forward, will we also trust him in those times? See, will we trust Jesus in the times that aren't the high points of life? See, what makes it even worse is somehow there's this false teaching that's infiltrated our culture that, that suggests that if we just trust in Jesus enough, then all of our life will be safe and easy and blessed and wonderful. And that seems great. Like, I'd sign up for that except for the fact that it's not true. Because the fact is that Jesus was perfectly obedient to the Father. He was perfect and without sin in his life was not without pain and difficulty and hardship. In fact, his obedience led him to the place of the cross. The remaining 11 disciples after Jesus' death and resurrection, there's 11 because Judas commits suicide after Jesus. The 11 continue on doing their best to honor and follow Jesus and spread his message and 10 of those 11 are brutally killed and martyred because they refused to reject Jesus as the Messiah. The only one who wasn't was John who sent to an island to basically die by himself in solitude. Their life was not without pain or hardship or difficulty. Their life was not full of ease and comfort. And our life isn't promised to be that either. The thing we do have as a promise though is that God will be with us, that God will be walking with us in the difficulties, bringing guidance, bringing hope, bringing the reminder that in the end, all things will be made right and we get eternity with him. So the question is, will we trust him in the meantime? Will we trust Jesus when our life is hard and we're weary? When we don't understand the, the suffering we're in, when we don't understand why things are difficult and aren't perfect? Will we trust Jesus when he calls us to walk in a direction we don't wanna go? When we go, God, I'd really rather not do that, will we be like Jesus, as we saw last week, and pray, okay, not my will, but your will be done? Will we trust Jesus when associating ourselves with him seems to cost us something? See, like Peter here, I believe many of us will get to the place of having a moment of temptation to deny Jesus because saying, yes, I believe in Jesus might cost us something. Because our world is moving increasingly to the point that Jesus isn't tolerated, he's not promoted, he's not seen as a positive. And we may have a point where saying yes to Jesus costs us something socially, financially, relationally. Will we still trust him in those moments? 
Because my hope for you is that you would build a faith that is strong, that is solid on a, a foundation of truth. Because if it is built on fair weather only, then it's gonna flee in the times that matter most. So we have the danger of proximity thinking, we have the danger of fair weather faith. Finally, we have the danger of underestimating God's plans. The, the final characters in the story are the religious leaders. We've kind of talked around them a little bit. But they were the ones that were supposed to be the good guys. They were the ones that were supposed to be on Jesus' side, making his mission easier and better. And they were the ones who led his path to crucifixion. You see, even in, earlier in the book, or the chapter 22 of Luke here, that they go, okay, guys, now's the time. This Passover celebration, now's the time we're going to arrest Jesus. And they've been scheming for years. This isn't a new idea for them because they hated Jesus and his teaching. They didn't believe that he was the Messiah. They didn't believe that he was the son of God who had come down. They hated how he, they, that Jesus opposed their teachings and their practices and they were looking for a way to just make it all go away. And in their minds, they said, hey, if we can just get rid of Jesus, then we can get back to the old way, where we're the ones in charge, where people are looking to us, where we're leading everything here. And they believed that by killing him, they would end his momentum, they would end his impact, and at the end, they would win. And I really think that for the most part of this process, they thought they succeeded at this. And even as they are, are beating and mocking Jesus here at the end of this passage, there's this air that they're gloating. They're like, ah, oh, we got you now. But in a great irony, their acts to end God's plans were actually the ones that brought his plans to fruition. They were the conduit that God used to bring his plan to fruition in the fact that Jesus would be crucified for us and they had underestimated it so much. And for those of us who believe in Jesus, I wonder if sometimes we do the same thing. If we look at, at God's plans for our life and our world, if we underestimate, if we underestimate how much he loves us, we look at our life and we just see the failures, we see the shortcomings, we see the sins, the ways that we've fallen short, and we answer for God and say, yeah, you wouldn't love me. Maybe you underestimate his ability to redeem the difficult things of your life. You look at your life and your hurts and your pains and the tragedies that you've walked through and you think there's no way to make any of this go away. And in those places that you see dead ends, God sees as opportunities to heal and restore and redeem and to create opportunities for you to bless others through that. Maybe you underestimate his power to work in your life and you say with your mouth, God can do anything. God can change any situation. He can fix any problem, but on the inside, you don't believe it. And so you either wear yourself out trying to fix it yourself or you just get to a place of hopelessness because you know you can't fix it and you don't think God can either. Or maybe you think and you underestimate his ability to use you to make a difference. You think, well, I don't have gifts of public speaking. I'm not eloquent enough. I'm not skilled or educated enough. I don't have the right background. I'm not good enough for God to use to make a difference. And we erroneously think that God's looking for perfect people to use to make a difference in the world. And we forget that here in this moment, we see one of the chief failures of Peter, but are also reminded how he would go on to be an incredible leader for the church to shepherd the, the message of, of God's truth to the booming nation there. We forget how, as we read the New Testament, we meet another individual named Paul who is one of those Pharisees who opposed Jesus, who took his effort into finding and killing Christians because he didn't believe any of it until he did, until he met Jesus and Jesus changed his life and he became the most prolific evangelist and missionaries in that era. He went on to write most of the New Testament because he believed so strongly in this truth of who Jesus was. That's what God can do if we are willing and if we are faithful to follow him. He can use us to make a difference. See, as we look at this, we get the option of which path we choose here. If we're gonna follow the patterns of Judas, of Peter, of the Pharisees and religious leaders, 
misunderstanding, mis- underestimating, falling into the dangers and the traps of mistruths. We get the choice of how we navigate the fact that we're approaching Easter, this worldwide celebration of this incredible truth. But it's only a celebration for us if it applies to us. The only way that the wonderful truths of Easter apply to us is if we choose to surrender our life to Jesus and follow him. To daily choose to walk in faith and obedience to who he is and what he's called us to do. And if we do that, then we get to rejoice. We get to walk in truth and trust in Jesus and see him work in powerful ways in and through our life. But the choice is ours. We walk in truth or we walk blind and find ourselves in the dangers of misinformation like these did here in this passage. And we pray that you would choose truth, that you would walk with Jesus and see him change your life in an incredible way. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that we have truth available to us that we don't have to wander and question and, and be confused at, at what it means to follow and honor you. God, I thank you for your word, which is full of truth and wisdom and direction and guidance for our life. And the fact that you have faithfully preserved it for us to bring us to this place where we can know what it means to follow you and worship you. But God, we also acknowledge that there's so many things pulling and tugging at us, so many difficult places that we can fall into, so many traps of misinformation, of the pull of culture, of the pull of lies that God, it's our desire and our prayer to just follow you and be faithful. So I pray today that you would help us to do that. God, we want to be on your winning team, but we know that our heart is sinful and wicked above all else and wants to pull us on the other side. So God, help us to walk in wisdom, to walk in truth and in faith and obedience to you so that we can remain on your side each and every day until you come back with glory and power and make all things new. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. If today's message spoke to you and you'd like to support the ministry of Calvary, you can visit our website at calvaryaz.com. Our homepage has links to contact us, to give, listen to past sermons, and subscribe to the Word for the Day daily devotionals. Well, I hope the Lord has blessed you and you have a fantastic week ahead. I hope you join us again next week. Bye-bye.